and the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights for organizing this forum and for including this very important topic on the agenda. My name is Sonia Stefanovska Trajanovska. I'm UNDP anti corruption advisor with the Regional Anti Corruption Project, and I will be moderating this session here in Suva. I will be assisted uh, by a few colleagues uh, because it's a combined offline and online session. My colleague John Hyde, who is online, is Tita, who is uh, physically here in the office, and also Catherine from the High Commissioner, who is uh, online. They will be assisting with uh, facilitation of the questions from the audience and uh, from uh, the participants uh, joining online. Uh, let me start by sharing a few facts. First, Corruption poses a serious threat to the enjoyment of human rights. This has been recognized by the Human Rights Council and the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. It is also recognized by us at UNODC and UNDP working on the anti-corruption agenda as well. The th threat that corruption at all levels poses to human rights globally has become much more acute with the catastrophic effects of COVID-19. During our session today, we will seek to examine how the business and human rights agenda is articulated in the UN guiding principles on business and human rights and anti-corruption efforts relate to each other. Recognizing that corruption undermines enjoyment of human rights during our session today, we will also seek to clarify how corruption involving the private sector impacts right holders in terms of corruption being linked to, causing, or contributing to human rights abuses. Finally, today we are also hoping to learn what measures can be taken by government authorities, business and civil society actors, to address corruption when it does negatively impact human rights in the con context of business-related activity with respect to both prevention of negative impact as well as in providing access to effective remedy. For, for us to learn more about this topic, we have a fantastic lineup of speakers that agreed to be part of the panel today. I take pleasure in introducing the panel lineup, which is consisting of Ms. Anita Ramasastri, who is chair of the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights, Ms. Miliana Ramatanivai from the Pacific Youth Alliance Forum, Ms. Annika White, the UNODC Regional Anti-Corruption Advisor, who is working under the Anti-Corruption Regional Project, uh, and also, um, uh, we have excuses from uh, one panelist that uh, initially was planned to, to join us, but unfortunately he had some, uh, some urgent priorities. Uh, the president uh, of the Kiribati Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Tonga Nibeya, excused himself and is sending his support to the deliberations. Uh, of the panelists, only Miliana is uh, here with me physically and the rest of the panel is uh, online. We will first hear from our first uh, uh, three speakers and then we will ask uh, uh, questions from the first from the room and then from online questions, but also we will encourage uh, perhaps additional discussions and reflections uh, from among the panelists. Uh, for those joining online, uh, you're most welcome to type your questions in the Zoom chat box during the presentations. Please indicate whether the question is addressed to any particular panelist. After the presentations, we will open the floor for uh, questions and answers, and then uh, we will uh, continue with our exchanges as, uh, 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 in, as uh, per the interests of the audience. Um, our session will last until three o'clock, which means we have a little less than one and a half hours uh, to complete the session. So I'm kindly asking everybody to be mindful of the time 
uh, allocated for presentation so that we can try and finish on time, but also enough sufficient time for meaningful discussion. Without further ado, let me introduce our first distinguished speaker, Ms. Anita Ramasastri, who is the chair of the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights. She is the Ronald L. York Professor of Law and the director of the graduate program in sustainable international development at the University of Washington School of Law. She researches and teaches in the fields of law and development, anti-corruption, international commercial law, and business and human rights. She has authored num numerous scholarly articles and reports focused on emerging issues in business and human rights. Ms. Ramasastri is joining us today from Seattle in the Eastern Pacific, and she will speak about business-related human rights abuses from the Pacific in a global context. With thanks for accepting to speak, uh, I please uh, join me in welcoming Ms. Ramasastri. Over Great. to you, Ms. Ramasastri. Thank, Thank you, you so much uh, for that introduction, Sonia, and to you and ODC, and again to uh, the forum for inviting me to join you on to talk about this important topic. Um, I will be focusing on some findings of a major report. I'm going to share my screen with you so you can just see some slides that will help us, I think, um, with uh, setting the stage um, for the discussion today. Um, great. I hope you can see them, yes? Yes, we can see. Okay, great. So I'm going to just focus and start by just explaining to you a little bit about why we think as a working group, business and human rights and anti-corruption are two agendas that should be connected more fully and why this is very important to the larger human rights agenda. So as I mentioned, the working group authored a report which I led and we presented to the Human Rights Council, so to all of the governments in July of 2020. But I wanna just say, why did we do this? And why do we think this topic is important? Well, the first reason is that this concept that may have been discussed at the forum today, responsible business conduct, is meant to include two things that business is supposed to do. One is they're supposed to focus on preventing corruption. And I was here with you at the plenary and I heard some discussion of that from the different speakers. But at the same time, businesses are meant to also focus on respect for human rights. So they're supposed to do these two things among others as part of this larger package of responsible business conduct. But as we've discovered in many instances, companies have separate processes. They have different parts if they're larger companies that focus on corruption. And often that's because the law makes them do that. There are stronger anti-corruption laws and that they may have different parts of the company dealing with corporate social responsibility or sustainability, but it's a different group of people so that we have different approaches to these. And sadly, for many companies, even SMEs, where it might just be one person as the, the manager or the founder, there's only an anti-corruption uh, policy, but there isn't yet a business and human rights policy. So there's a separation. But this occurs within government as well, that ministries that deal with companies, whether it's a ministry of justice that's enforcing the law or a ministry of commerce or trade, that they often have different focuses, that you don't find an integrated approach to responsible business conduct. So that's my first point. So the working group said, well, why is this? And would it be beneficial to think of these issues together? But what's more important, and I hope we'll discuss, and I've heard a little bit about this before, is that there's been a lot of connection in the larger global frameworks around how human rights, in, uh, corruption impacts human rights. But very often that focus is on the public sector, meaning that we focus on when citizens have to pay bribes to go, get education, to go to school, to get access to a doctor, when judges are corrupt, when someone might again have to pay a police officer a bribe, that much of our focus on how pay, uh, corruption impacts individuals' human rights has focused on what happens when the government official is corrupt, when the judge is corrupt, when the police officer is corrupt, when the doctor in the state hospital is corrupt. But what the working group said is what we do need to focus even more on is when business in, is engaged in corruption. Right? And we talk about businesses and we talk about when they pay bribes, but we often 
describe that as kind of economic um, corruption, right? Businesses are paying bribes to speed up processes, to get goods clear to customs, to get a permit faster. And our message back is no, that when businesses engage in corruption to gain an economic advantage, they do so often with significant human rights impacts. So our major message in the report is that business related corruption is not victimless, right? So when a business tries to get ahead with a corrupt activity, there are victims and there are human rights abuses attached to that. So the report provides examples of those impacts. So a business may engage in fraud or pay a bribe, for example, to, ga to, to gain a land title, right? But this might be one of the examples and this will lead to communities and people being displaced from their land. So the business wants the land, but the human rights impact relates to all of us if we, are, we lose our property, our right to, to, to our livelihood. The second is if a business pays a bribe to sidestep an environmental or other kind of impact assessment, right? When a business needs to develop a project, open a mine, it needs to get permits. And it may often pay that bribe again to cut corners, but for people that leads to significant harm, right? Whether it is a health issue, increased pollution, the working group has experienced in many of our travels uh, for the UN, you know, safety issues, dams collapsing and killing people because corruption led to uh, no inspections. And, and with the pandemic, what we're seeing is that when a bribe is paid to a business, let's say a pharmaceutical company to divert medicine or equipment or vaccines from the supply chain, this can lead to possible death. So I hope the main message is business related human rights abuses, uh, a corrupt activity, I'm sorry, leads to human rights abuses. So I'll just conclude with three other slides to say, what does the report say? And I hope that this will help you uh, with your discussion today. Pillar one in the role of the state is that states need more policy coherence. And I apologize, I'm looking here and seeing uh, poor spell check. So I think this is the wrong version, but states need more policy coherence. They think need to think about issues like access to remedy and issues in corruption cases. So when a bribe is paid, prosecutors, government officials need to think about was there a human rights impact? And should that influence the way in which the case is pursued, investigated, and then what the sanction is? Second, we should require businesses when they are seeking a contract from the government or a benefit. So a business applying for a loan, a business getting a trade preference, a business getting a procurement contract. We often, governments will ask those businesses to demonstrate a, or make a pledge to no bribery and no corruption. This is the same thing we need to ask for in terms of a commitment to the guiding principles in human rights. So when governments are helping companies, they need to ask for responsibility back, but the responsibility needs to be both. No corruption, no human rights abuses. And third, that there are policy reforms that, that are important for states to enact because they are important for corruption prevention and for human rights promotion. And an example of this is what we call beneficial ownership laws, right? That many companies disguise who is truly behind them, who owns them through shell or dummy companies. And so there are law reforms that are, that are undergoing and policy movements to say we need transparency there. But our message is that transparency is not just important to the tax collector in a country, right? It's not about just tax evasion. But when we talk to victims on the ground, when there's been a human rights issue relating to a mine or a development project, the victims often can't figure out who owns the company. So this is an important issue, not just for corruption, but for human rights. And what about the private sector? Just a few points. This first one is that businesses need to consider how to engage in both corruption compliance and human rights due diligence in ways that helps. And we talk about this concept of red flags. If a company talks to people in a community or to people who they are engaging with and consulting with, and those people identify not only the human rights risk of business activity, but they also talk about corruption, the company needs to listen and say, wait a minute, this is another issue we must consider and prevent. Similarly, when a company understands that a particular market or business sector has a high corruption risk, that should mean 
that they need to do serious human rights due diligence because with corruption comes human rights abuses. And this is really global. So I look forward to hearing about concerns in the Pacific, but my remarks are not just about the Pacific. They're setting the stage to say, these are things that we, we notice globally. And finally, companies should screen their business partner, partners, not just for corruption. You want honest business partners, but you wanna to start to ask them questions about their human rights records as well. And the last, my last remark here is that when we talk about the guiding principles, the largest issue is access to remedy. That you're going to, I'm sure you've discussed in the forum here that really the real reason we have business and human rights as a movement is because victims or rights holders don't have anywhere to go for an effective remedy. We see the same thing in the area of corruption. When there has been a corrupt, an allegation of corruption and a government pursues a company and prosecutes the company or the manager, a fine is paid, but there isn't usually any thought as to the impact to the individuals. To give you an example of the case that an NGO is pursuing in Mexico, a different place, because of bribery in a particular uh, healthcare system, 50 people died because their dialysis machines were not working properly, right? That the equipment didn't function because bribes were paid and there wasn't enough money to buy ones that did. But there was no remedy, even though the government is pursuing the case for the individuals and the family members who lost their loved ones. And the question is, should there not be? And there is a movement now to look at this issue of access to remedy when there is this connection between corruption and human rights. So it's a big issue and a big challenge. But I just want to say that we do see a strong connection between the guiding principles and corruption. And we do, and we will continue to, to work on how these agendas can be mutually reinforcing. So again, thanks to UNODC and more generally, I look forward to hearing from all of you today. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you so much, Ms. Ramasastri, um, for setting the stage uh, and for putting the issue into the context. Um, for walking us through uh, the recent report of the UN Human Rights Council and shedding light on the, what responsible business conduct means. So it's, uh, it's not about um, either corruption or human rights, it should be both. So there is an appeal for an integrated approach and uh, there is a role for the uh, state and role for the, for the private uh, sector in making this uh, happen. Also, thank you for um, uh, alerting on the need uh, for access uh, to proper rem remedy and integrated approach to, to, to this um, issue. Um, thank you very much. I would like to propose now that we move to the next uh, speaker, Ms. Um, Miliana Ramatanivai from the Pacific Youth uh, Alliance Forum. Emiliana joins us uh, here in the Suva. She's uh, an active youth advocate uh, and member of the Pacific Forum uh, Youth Forum Against Corruption. She's a strong advocate on good governance, sound uh, financial management, and strengthening institutional capacity of community-based groups. She joined uh, our team, the team of our original anti-corruption project. And I think this is worth mentioning um, uh, uh, during the um, uh, last year's conference of ANCAC state parties <coughs> in Abu Dhabi, where she spoke on youth integrity issues, as well as at a special session for world parliamentarians. So she has many heads, many roles, um, a wealth of experience because she's also a farmer and a market vendor which means she also has a business head. So this makes her qualified to, to share her views. Uh, <coughs> and I will um, specifically like to ask her on this occasion to try and represent the civil society views and um, tell us whether she thinks there is a role for civil society on this agenda, what that role might be and what measures and steps can be taken by civil society to reduce business-related human rights abuses. Over to you, Miliana. Um, thank you so much, Sonia, for the interventions. And uh, thank you, Anita, for your interventions earlier. So briefly, I would just like to introduce the group that I'm representing, the Pacific Youth Forum Against Corruption. 
So the Pacific Youth Forum Against Corruption is a network of Pacific youth anti-corruption advocates from 13 Pacific Island countries. So the network was formed in 2015 at the conclusion of uh, a UN governance and leadership training that took place here in Nandi, in Fiji. So at the conclusion of the 2015 training, we decided to form the Pacific Youth Forum Against Corruption. And basically it's just mobilizing Pacific youth in the fight against corruption in the region. So I'm here as part of the Pacific Youth Forum Against Corruption, but I've also been asked to speak on behalf of the Pacific CSO family. And it is without a doubt that when you talk about business related human rights abuse, corruption is at the center of it all. Corruption is the elephant in the room. I was speaking to a colleague before, and we were talking about how we don't really address it openly here in the Pacific region, probably because of the geopolitical situation that we have in different Pacific Island governments and the capacity we have as members of the CSO community, a small Pacific CSO community, I must add. So what we, um, what we have been doing as members of the Pacific CSO under the Pacific Islands uh, Association of Non-Governmental Organizations of Piango, basically we've just been trying to lobby and amplify, amplify issues that are faced by resource owners. If we look at business-related human rights abuse in the region, most of it has to do with resource owners, with our indigenous communities. And this week, currently on trial here in Fiji, is the free soul Malolo development that is currently being trialed in the court right now. So that is just, that is just a snapshot of the very huge can of worms that is present in terms of business-related human rights abuse. But what we're trying to advocate for as civil society organizations and in answering the question that was posed to me, the role that we play is basically facilitating the exchange between government and resource owners, government and those that will be directly impacted by businesses. So trying to create that space, trying to have that Talanoa, I would say, that seems to be like the in thing right now, having a Talanoa. So how do we foster that as civil society organizations? In Fiji, we've had the Citizens Constitutional Forum that is taking a human rights approach to talking with resource owners before developments take place. I would like to raise here the free prior and informed consent that we had been advocating for, the Pacific CSO family, so before developments take place on resources, we would like indigenous people to be consulted prior to any developments taking place within that community. Because at the end of the day, we are the ones, we are the ones that will be impacted by this. And it's important to note as well that businesses may not all understand what human rights is. Some do, some probably do but choose to ignore it. Some don't at all. They just choose to operate in a vacuum, I would say. So we have a role too in terms of advocating, trying to create awareness. And I would like to see more of this happening in the future because we haven't really done that. A room where we are all together, the private sector, members of the government, and us, the civil society organizations. Because I think we've been working in silos and I think it's about time that we come in and sit together and have that Talno that I was talking about. Because when you think about it, the Pacific region is a resource rich region. And with that being said, a lot of the businesses coming in to invest are coming in in the extractives and construction industry and tourism industry. So when we go down to communities as CSOs, talking to them about environmental impact assessment, talking to them about obtaining fr free prior and informed consent. We need to take it down to them too and articulate it in the language they understand because language can be a barrier in getting them to understand this. 
and tell them that these are your rights. You have rights as resource owners to question these businesses. You have rights to question Yongolingoli or fishing grounds. You have the right to talk to question deep sea mining that's happening at your backyard. So I'm pretty happy that I can see a lot of young people present here today. And that is encouraging because the onus is on us moving this forward. Because at the end of the day, all of this is going to impact us. Some of us are feeling the impacts now. Backtracking a little bit, I'm sorry if I'm a bit off track here. I'm just, I think, too passionate about this. But here in Fiji, we've got the Black Sand Mining Project that's happening in Ba. And that started in 2008. <clears throat> and we've been advocating on how there was no free prior and informed consent. They weren't aware of it. So CSOs were lobbying about it, but then we realized we were not really articulating it in the language that was understood by these resource owners. So we have to bring in a local person that understands their dialect and talks to them in their language. And they rely, so they relied on the Bar River. Most of them rely on it for mud crabs. And they were noticing that as a subsequent consequence of the black sand mining that was happening, the size of mud crabs that were, they normally got from that river, it was just decreasing in size. So food security is the issue there. So these are just some of the basic human rights issues that we have in the Pacific region and the way that we can assist as CSO. So our job is to lobby for the communities on the ground, lobby for them with businesses, lobby with government, lobby to government and also advocating and amplifying their issues. So if you know there's something happening in your backyard, there's a development taking place and you know it's just, it's not have, it's having an adverse effect on your resources, then please feel free to come forward and talk to us about it at the Pacific Youth Forum Against Corruption or talk to the CSO community here in the country and in the region as well. So those are just some of the stuff that we can do as civil society organizations. But I think the onus is really on us having that conversation, government, businesses, and the CSO community. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Miliana, um, for your really your enlightening um, remarks. Uh, for bringing in the um, voice of the Pacific Youth Forum Against Corruption, which means bringing in the voice of youth. And youth in the Pacific is half of the population. It's a very, very important um, group, and that is the future of, of the Pacific. So this is the voice we just have to listen to. Um, I, I am taking um, from your um, remarks uh, a few conclusions or a few um, points, and one is um, um, uh, um, a really alerting on, on potential knowledge gap in the private sector, which needs to be bridged. They not necessarily are sensitized or aware how human rights uh, abuses may be happening or should not be happening. So they may need um, some help with uh, getting knowledge, getting additional trainings and awareness as to how um, the corruption and um, human rights uh, abuses can be addressed within the private sector. Civil society can help bring this knowledge and facilitate um, also the cooperation between the state and, and the private sector. There is a role of facilitator and of a broker of um, um, potential partnership towards addressing the, the, the issues in the private sector. Also the role of um, the civil society to lobby with, um, uh, with the government and with the private sector on behalf of individuals. This is also important uh, point that uh, was uh, brought in um, about um, uh, citizens and, and individuals as, as right holders. And then um, uh, they should also be able and uh, sensitize and aware how they can, can claim and enjoy their, their human rights across uh, the board, right? In all sectors and in all areas of, of their living. Um, thank you so much, uh, very enlightening um, for us and some food for thought also, uh, hopefully during the discussion. 
uh, I would like now to propose as we move on to the next uh, speaker, uh, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Ms. Annika White. Uh, she is the o UNODC Regional uh, uh, Anti-Corruption Advisor uh, under the joint UNODC UNDP Pacific Regional Anti-Corruption Project uh, and the designated UNODC representative uh, in the Pacific. She has been, and my dear colleague as well, well we work together on uh, the regional project. Uh, she has been with UNODC for a long time, since March 2009. Uh, previously, she worked at the UNODC headquarters, and since 2013, she uh, has moved into the Pacific. Annika is a lawyer with a Bachelor of Law, a Bachelor of Economic and Social Sciences from the University of Sydney. Also, she holds a Master in Public International Law from the University of Leiden and a Master in Public Policy from the University of Oxford, where she was a public service scholar. So um, she has wealth of uh, knowledge and experience on uh, this issue, and she will speak uh, about the need to reinforce the anti-corruption efforts in the Pacific region and ensure that the linkages between business-related human rights impacts and corruption brought about by COVID-19 are properly addressed. With this, um, I would like to welcome Annika and she's joining us online from Australia. Over to you, Annika, and thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Sonia, and um, a naka to everybody and um, a heartfelt thanks also to OHCHR for organizing the first UN Pacific Forum on Business and Human Rights. It's a, it's a great privilege to be here and to be part of this session. Thank you very much to Anita and of course to Millie. Um, always, always a pleasure to, to work with you. Um, I should say that uh, thank you to Sonia. She's my sister in anti-crime as, as I like to put it. While I am the UNODC hat, she's the UNDP hat to our project. And uh, we have our wonderful colleagues also online. We have John Hyde, we have Sanda. So thank you very much to both of you. Um, I would, uh, I think the way in which I'd like to start this is by saying, and using a proverb actually, where if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And this wonderful analogy in the Pacific that we often use is the canoe. You can paddle on one side and you may as well be going in circles, but if you, work together. And this is where we were talking about these silos. This is the word that Millie used and the disconnect that has been. We need to work on both sides in order to propel our canoe forwards. And it's no longer about seeing the Pacific as a vast ocean. Often, and I also like to use this expression, is that people think it's the ocean that divides us in the Pacific, but actually it's what unites us. Um, so I I'm going to, to draw on a few of this, and I think the overview that I want to look at is corruption in human rights, yes, during COVID in the Pacific through the business lens, then turning to corruption in COVID-19, some Pacific insights that we would like to share with you, then drawing on, yes, these international and regional frameworks. And here, I really want to articulate their frameworks, but what is key is domesticating them and finding local solutions. Solutions that are driven by Pacific Islanders for Pacific Islanders. Um, some of the actions that um, could be taken to mitigate some of the corruption risks and therefore the human rights abuses that we're talking about. And then finally, to talk about the UN Pacific Regional Anti-Corruption Project, some of the actions we've taken in this space and some future actions that we're looking towards. Um, so if it's okay, I'll quickly, I'll go on. Um, so as Sonia mentioned in the very beginning, corruption poses a serious threat to the enjoyment of civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights. That is undeniable. And I just wanted to put a little bit of a snapshot up there. So even just looking at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, what are we really looking at? I mean, corruption at any level corrodes the corrodes the respect for the rule of law, undermines public service accountability, transparency, weakens democratic institutions. It destroys the very fabric of our society. And this is why we need to entwine the two issues and not see them as separate any longer. 
there on the screen, you can see equality before the law, arbitrary detention, fair trial, freedom of opinion and expression, but also corruption ruins that fair and equal access to fundamental economic, social and cultural rights, such as the right to health, um, also the right to education and more generally that right to development. Um, so I would say that now the, the threat that corruption poses at all levels is affecting human rights globally, but it's being exacerbated. It's becoming more catastrophic, I would argue, with COVID-19. And what do I mean by that? So um, up on the, the screen, um, the next one, thank you, John, you can see that um, the COVID-19 pandemic is a public health emergency, but it is far more. It is an economic crisis, a social crisis, a human crisis that is fast becoming a human rights crisis. A human rights lens puts everyone in the picture and ensures that no one is left behind. Now, I have to say that when we look at corruption, one of the fundamental mistakes that we made in the past, and I hope that we are learning from it and that we are not doing it anymore, is to really look at it through a law enforcement lens. In broadening that lens, we are able to understand and appreciate the ramifications of the impacts worldwide, and notably in the Pacific. So in many countries, we have the, the basic access to clean water, food, sanitation, education, it's all facing serious disruption. Now COVID-19 combined with corruption is indeed threatening. All of these rights that I just spoke about, but if we just take the right to health, for example, it could be the bribery of doctors, medical staff, um, the receiving of undue priority treatments, or as Anita pointed out, not even getting the service. And even, even if you do get the service, are you getting the, pharmaceut the pharmaceutical goods that you thought? What about the ventilators? And now, of course, the big question is the vaccine. This is on everybody's mind. How can we ensure that we don't have these corruption risks in the allocation and the distribution of this vaccine? Great questions that we need to ask ourselves, of course, now. Now, the question posed up there, who is being left? behind. Now, entrenched and systemic discrimination marginalizes far too many. Women, girls, migrants, refugees, um, indigenous populations, ethnic, racial, religious, and sexual minorities, and excludes them from the full enjoyment of human rights, hampering the kind of all-inclusive approach that we actually need to fight COVID-19, to fight corruption, and to uphold human rights. Now, in the Pacific, the violence against women has increased um, during the extended lockdown periods. And um, that's been because people are finding them themselves confined at homes with abusive partners, and also where they haven't had that support, the support centers, the shelters, and it's just not available like it used to be. And so in Fiji, for example, there was a marked increase in the number of women seeking assistance from domestic violence between February and March of this year. So Samoa recorded 150% increase in helpline calls compared to last year. And in Tonga, there was a 54% increase in the number of cases coming to the Women's Crisis Center during COVID-19. So all of these issues um, are profound in every way. And in turning to the next slide to look at the human rights challenges in the Pacific, I mean, what are we facing when it comes to COVID? I mean, this pandemic has really exacerbated us. Um, so we have a huge drop in tourism across the region. We have slashed income investments. We have that interruption of supply chains. We have the fueling of organized crime on different fronts. On different fronts. We have sharp downturns in GDP growth and employment. And of course, linked to all of this is that economic and social uncertainty. All of these factors are leading to increased inequality, straining public health and social systems. 
And when will we ever get back to normal and how and, and all these questions are being posed. And at the moment, what we can see is that there has been a rollout of emergency measures. And this has concerned us because there haven't been the necessary safeguards in place. And while, yes, you need to do the public expenditure in order to stimulate, stimulate growth and ensure that um, the, the social welfare and the fabric continues, we need to be mindful of what the consequences may be. So this social and economic impact is profound. And of course, you know, if we also look at when and will, when and how will things change, it is hard to predict. So SCAP, um, they produced a report where they, of course, admitted that they don't know the full scale of what it may mean in terms of COVID-19, but the possibility of double digit contractions in GDP cannot be ruled out, for example, for the Cook Islands, for Fiji, for Palau, for Samoa, for Vanuatu. Unemployment figures are staggering. So in Vanuatu, for example, it's close to 40% of the formal workforce that are out of a job, not to mention the informal sector. And then, of course, around 80% of the global tourism industry, which also the Pacific is no exception to, compromises of micro and small medium sized enterprises, which is really feeling the effects of these economic shocks. I mean, this would be the handicraft, the souvenirs of Fiji and Vanuatu. Um, I mean, even in Tonga, one third of households that relied on the tourism are now not being able to access that anymore. It is profound what this means for us, and we will only really come to terms with it, I think, as time goes on. But I also wanted to highlight the next slide where we were wondering what some of these emergency packages have been. What is what, what have they what have they looked like? What are some of the risks associated with it? So we did this survey on the oversight mechanisms for economic relief, rescue and stimulus measures in the fight against corruption. Of course, this is also relevant to human rights and this is why I wanted to mention it to you. And we had 14 Pacific Island countries respond. Now we had hoped to be able to share this report with you. Um, unfortunately, the consultant we hired personally contracted COVID-19, went into the intensive care unit, thankfully is okay, but we're delayed with this report. So I apologize, um, but we'll hopefully be able to share it with you in early 2021. But some of the things that I wanted to highlight to you is that 13 of the Pacific Island countries have introduced these kinds of relief packages and the 14th was planning to do so, even though there wasn't a confirmed COVID-19 case yet. Now, a lot of these measures, of course, were cash payouts, grants, tax rebates. But what we were looking at were these safeguards. And only three respondents from two Pacific Island countries actually spoke concretely about how they had put in place measures to prevent fraud and corruption in the disbursement of these funds. And one respondent spoke about how a specialized oversight or anti-corruption body was consulted. And only one other knew of civil society being involved in the oversight in the distribution of those funds. So a lot more was in this survey. So it'll be very interesting and quite insightful for many of us to understand what are some of the corruption risks. And of course, we did hear about the shrinking civil space um, for example, in Vanuatu, one of the emergency measures that was rolled out required the media before they could report on COVID-19 to gain um, official approval. So some of these areas were very much being looked at. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about the global framework and the regional framework to set the context, at least on the anti-corruption front, in order for us to appreciate what entry points we have, what are some of the levers. And as Anita mentioned in the very beginning, responsible business basically being corruption prevention and respect for human rights. So we have the UN Convention Against Corruption, UNCAC. All 14 Pacific Island countries are states parties to it. That means that they have not only committed to this legal binding global anti-corruption instrument, but they are also part of an intergovernmental peer review process. 
You may ask yourself, why is this important? How is this key? How is this relevant? Well, it allows us to firstly work with countries to do a self-assessment, then they are peer assessed by others to appreciate what are the legislative, the institutional and the practical frameworks in place. We often argue that you were as strong as your weakest link on the criminal justice chain. And so what might that be? There are good practices that come out of it, but also recommendations to understand what may Pacific Island countries like to prioritize, focus on going forwards. A lot of these turn into implementation plans. More Pacific Island countries are developing a whole of society approach, bringing civil, civil society and the private sector into the fold, also putting them onto these national anti-corruption coordination committees that help to oversee, for example, some of these national anti-corruption strategies. And if you take care of us, for example, that has one, they developed a strategy and they've nearly implemented 70, nearly 80% of it. So you can see progress being taken in individual countries. The frameworks that a lot of countries have used is this convention. And I mentioned chapter two because it looks at corruption prevention. This is exactly what Anita was talking about in the very beginning. Um, we also, I'd like to also mention that we have the UNGAS, which is the UN um, special session on corruption that will be held next year. And in that space, specific voices are being heard more and more. And in notably, the president of Kiribati has been a very vocal advocate of this. Um, in turning to SDG 16, so we have the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Um, many of you know this very well. It is anchored into many national plans and being driven on many fronts. Um, and I would just wanted to highlight to many of you SDG 16. Sometimes it's a little overlooked, not by practitioners like us, but I think especially if you're in a certain space, it's not always easy to draw all the linkages, but this we call an end goal in itself, but also enabler of all the others. So here it's promoting peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, providing that access to justice for all and building effective, accountable and inclusive institutions at all levels. And this is needed in order to be able to achieve all the sustainable development goals. Um, I'll turn to the next one on regional frameworks because this allows us in the Pacific to set the context. We do have, of course, the Forum 8 Principles of Accountability, um, the Bitakwa Declaration, we also have Pacific Regionalism, the Bow Declaration, its implementation plan, and notably as of this year, the Tuweni vision. And this is the Pacific Unity Against Corruption vision. And it is a, a guiding document that is being used more and more by Pacific Islanders and also leaders in order to be able to contextualize the situation and emphasize how it is so important in the Pacific. So you can see the beautiful sail there. So I use the analogy, of course, of the canoe in the beginning, but it's a sail as well in order to get the winds. And what I really liked is the president of Kiribati spearheaded this, and he really wanted to focus on catching the right winds where rough seas will be certain, as is the case of fighting corruption. But if you get it right, then you can sail on. Um, of course, it, it will be, it is a challenge, but we need to unite. We can't work in silos and the more coordination and collaboration, the better. Uh, we've been working very closely with the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat as the policy and coordination bo uh, body of the region in order to be able to ensure that this is regionally contextualized and taken up by the relevant bodies in order to be able to drive the process going forwards. Now, COVID-19 and corruption. So we put together an advisory note, um, if we just turn to the next slide, and I'm just going to quickly flip through a few of these recommendations. And why? Because they link exactly again to human rights. So the cooperation is nothing new for us. Yes, we say between government agencies, but then beyond include non-state actors. 
yes, as Billy says, it's civil society, but it's also the private sector, it's vulnerable groups, it's the media. It is a lot of different actors that need to be at the table and to be included in these decision-making processes in order to have that whole of society response. Um, of course, um, private sector business integrity, we need to make sure that this is up there and I will talk a little bit about it in, the mo in a moment to look at how we can ensure these efficient, transparent and accountable processes, um, be it through codes of conduct, compliance and so on and so forth. Youth, um, it's always wonderful the Pacific Youth Forum Against Corruption has been such a driving force. We have wonderful youth champions around the region and their voices are so key not only in this space, but as they take on prominent roles in government, as we've seen, pardon me, it has been instrumental in order to get this to a higher level and to ensure that buy-in at many different, the, the horizontal and the vertical levels. Now, creating an environment that is conducive to protect human rights. This is the one that we really need to look at. So yes, it is health, education, work, adequate standard of living, but it also is essentially adopting that human rights approach across the board to addressing corruption, not just on this or in that, but across the board, this is what we need to do, that human rights mainstreaming. Um, also ensuring the timely access to up-to-date, factual, accurate information and having clear communication channels um, between the public and the government. This has been tested of late in the region, but this is really key. Um, mitigating the financial flows, Yes, there's a lot of fraudulent behavior going on. There are a lot of scams with COVID-19, but we need to ensure smarter regulation. I didn't mention before money laundering, um, but it is also one of these key areas. And of course you have the financial action task force. You have the gray listing that they have in terms of the recommendations. Currently there are no countries on the gray list. Um, Papua New Guinea will, um, go under undergo review and then they be um, they may go on to the gray list is currently um, a prediction so we'll have to watch that space but of course we also have and this is this is also key and I wanted to highlight it to you um, is that there's the European Union um, list of non-cooperative jurisdictions for tax purposes. Um, and on that list, we unfortunately have Fiji, Palau, Samoa, Vanuatu. On that list, we also have American Samoa and Guam. And this is the EU's tool for tackling tax fraud, tax avoidance and money laundering. Something also that Anita spoke about in terms of business related corruption and how for the European Union, um, not having the necessary safeguards in place is a serious risk, which means that these banking systems of countries will ultimately not be used by the European Union. And this has consequences across the board um, in terms of any funds that may or may not um, be coming in. So just wanted to flag that one to you as well. In terms of, um, Moving on, I mean, yes, there's a lot of areas that we need to look at in terms of clear, objective, transparent criteria. First, it was for the funds of COVID. Now it'll be probably for the vaccines. Um, we need to look at identifying and addressing challenges in the distribution. Um, also, auditing. This is key comprehensive auditing, oversight, accountability and reporting mechanisms. Um, technological solutions, if and where possible. Procurement systems really need to be looked at because now with the emergency measures, some of these procurement systems have been shortened or overstepped. Also ensuring that the products that we're getting, including the vaccines, comply with international specifications. And being very clear in terms of you know, um, what rules should there really exist or what are the adequate legal frameworks in place to be able to, if we need again, roll out these kind of emergency measures, measures and 
legislation and policies going forward. So let's learn from what we have had in the past. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit, John, if you don't mind moving on to the UN Pacific Regional Anti-Corruption Project. So just the next slide. Um, this is where we are a joint UNODC and UNDP project. We've been in the Pacific since 2012. And uh, we are very grateful to the Australian government, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the New Zealand Aid Program for their support to the project. Um, we've been around for quite a while, which has allowed us to shift the mindset from short term gains to medium to long term investments and to see the impacts and essentially the, the fruits of the seeds that we've been planting over the years. Some of the work that we've done um, in particular now and linked to obviously corruption and human rights, if we turn to the next slide is focusing on access to information. So this is one of our publications that came out last year. If anybody would like a copy, please let us know. Um, very, very happy to share it with you. Um, but right to information for us has been key. So we did work with Vanuatu to develop the RTI policy, the legislation, set up the unit, and now working with the unit in order to roll out the trainings and to digitalize their process going forwards but also working with other Pacific Island countries, so Papua New Guinea and also Micronesia, using the Right to Information Unit of Vanuatu, as well as the Freedom of Information Division of the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner and the New Zealand Ombudsman to share their experiences in terms of what has been good practice and what has been challenging. And I have to say, I'm incredibly grateful for the candidness and the openness with which we have been able to develop this network um, and work with Pacific Island countries to be able to see what can be contextualized and what could be possible in different areas or in different countries. Um, I mean, freedom of opinion, expression and information, including freedom of the press, remain essential to open and accountable democratic governance. I mean, corruption thrives where there's the free exchange of ideas and information that are tightly restricted and deals that can be kept safe. So um, this is why uh, we also work with the media and um, there is the Pacific Network of Anti-Corruption Journalists that was established together with PINA, the Pacific Islands News Association, that uh, will be in full swing, hopefully going forwards, um, in order to be able to also look at investigative journalism in this space. Um, the next slide where we've also focused on business integrity. It's a bit of a new thing for us. Um, and we've been working a lot with youth entrepreneurs. And this has been, I think, very invigorating and um, really allowed us to see how integrity is just so fundamental for entrepreneurs and starting up businesses. And it is so hard at times where it is an easy dollar in the pocket, but you have to risk your own integrity, your business integrity in order to perhaps get it. And to understand what's right, what's wrong, to know what tools are out there, what are the laws, what are the institutions, how can I report it? Um, all of these factors have been looked at and working with Fiji, the Solomon Islands, soon to be Samoa and Palau as well, has just been great in this context of COVID-19 to be able to look at, as Anita was saying, responsible business. What is this? So some of these institutional partnerships that we've been brokering, for example, in Fiji with the Fiji Commerce and Employers Federation, the Youth Entrepreneurs Council in Fiji, the Ministry of Trade and Commerce, the Registrar of Business and the Ministry of Youth has just been great because everybody has come on board with the same aim and being able to use this to be able to drive other activities around the region is great. Um, so far, 85 youth um, entrepreneurs have benefited from these uh, business integrity workshops, and we hope a few more by the end of the year. Um, also, for example, um, in Savu Savu, we ran a workshop recently, and 18 of the 22 participants actually registered their businesses after the workshop with the Registrar of Businesses, or I should say throughout and after. Um, code of Conduct key compliance measures, working with the private sector, 
Um, and in Fiji, we've been doing this a lot more. Um, yes, we have a few drivers of integrity. Um, and I think it's always, always key. Um, Wame, he said, as young entrepreneurs, we need to uphold values of integrity and transparency, know our rights and have a moral compass. We have to advocate that this journey is not only for mature business people, it is for us. I encourage young entrepreneurs to fight for being a good business vendor so that we can change the mindset of younger generations and be great citizens of our country. And then of course, the next one also, this is by Litiana. As a woman from a rural area, I, know, I now know where I am, who I am and where I stand with my business. Honesty is the right way and young people are the future. Being a mother, I urge youth to build their business with honesty and follow the right way. And I think in this space, there's a lot more work to be done, but to be part of that journey to get the ball rolling has been really crucial. And I should say that Sonia has been spearheading a lot of this work. So if you have any questions, please direct them at her. Um, also in terms of the next areas that we're looking at, um, we will be bringing out a number of different publications, so keep your eye on this space. Um, and I'll mention just a few of them. So public procurement, a key area that I mentioned before that we really should be focusing a lot more on. Um, public reporting, um, then we will have a manual on developing a human sector, uh, a health sector corruption risk assessment and mitigation plan. Whistleblower protection, which of course links with the victim uh, protection that Anita was talking about, and we're going to have a gender dimension in that. We're going to also have a governance note on integrating anti-corruption into the SDG agenda. And last but not least, and I think this one will be very interesting, is corruption as a threat to human rights in the Pacific during COVID-19. So a lot of insights will be coming up. Um, the next area focusing on vulnerable groups, including women. So an anti-corruption toolkit was produced this year for women owned micro, small and medium enterprises that really allowed them to understand what are the laws in Fiji? Who does what, where can I go? Um, what are the avenues available for me and next steps? So I think this toolkit allowed us to develop a number of different trainings together with the Fiji Commerce and Employers Federation um, FICAC and the Fijian Competition and Consumer Commission um, to at least 15 women owned businesses in Fiji. And this was really key to be able to give them and empower them to have the knowledge to be able to address issues of corruption. Um, other spaces that we've looked at, we mentioned this whole of society approach, having that holistic integrity framework to address corruption, prevention and beyond. And I think this is where we have a detailed publication that you're very welcome to look at. We emphasize it throughout. It also focuses on how we can take a lot of these challenges, prioritize them um, with Pacific Island countries through implementation plans, national anti-corruption strategies with the necessary um, nationally driven uh, coordination mechanisms um, and the role of I wanted to highlight this last one, John, if you don't mind going to the next slide, the role of non-state actors and how key it is for them in particular in corruption prevention. This also includes, of course, parliamentarians. I wanted to really emphasize that. And on the 9th of December, we have International Anti-Corruption Day, which we're all very excited about. And in Fiji, there will be a big event. So just to flag it to everybody, and we will also be the, the Zoom link is up there, so if you'd like to join, we would very much welcome your participation. It will also be an opportunity to roll out a, um, an integrity campaign throughout Fiji. I won't give too much away, but um, it is very exciting. You may have heard a little bit about it on the radio already, um, but there is a little bit of a build up to it. Um, so that's all from me. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please feel, feel free to direct them at me or any of my colleagues. But the last note I wanted to leave you on is that how fundamental it is that we start to look at corruption 
also through a human rights lens that we entwine the issues to make sure that no one is left behind and that we can achieve the development agenda together going forwards through Pacific solutions in order to be able to prevent corruption, but also have a society that is full of integrity, accountability, and one that is for the future. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Annika, for um, a really um, inspirational, insightful, and uh, comprehensive overview um, of the issues, actors, sectors, uh, target groups, but also um, solutions, potential solutions. What can be done? What is being done? What else can be done? Um, it's really um, important for us also to be aware of the uh, of the broader contrast, which are the parameters for us to 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 be looking at uh, when we uh, analyze the um, specific issues that are relevant for us to address the uh, business uh, human rights abuses uh, and also in relation or their correlation with um, uh, our anti-corruption work. Also, thanks, uh, Annika, for bringing in the COVID-19 um, crisis. Uh, the world has changed. Unfortunately, some of the issues uh, have uh, worsened, uh, and the crisis um, uh, evidently turned out not to be only a health crisis, but also uh, economic, social crisis, and um, governance crisis, as well as a uh, human rights um, crisis. Um, uh, these are reasons more for us to be um, really dedicated and uh, focused to, to analyzing the issues and to, to finding the solutions so that at least we can um, we can try to, to, to bring our societies back to, to, to some situation that was before COVID-19 so in, in order for us to really be able to accelerate uh, progress against uh, SDGs, but also um, intrinsically linked with that agenda is a uh, is human rights um, agenda and, and the responsibility for us to promote, protect, uh, uh, and defend uh, uh, people's human rights. And one important question is really, who are those who are left behind? This is really the human rights uh, based approach that we need to, to be keeping in mind and how we bring them back in, in, in the main uh, mainstream development. Um, uh, with that, I would like once again to, to thank all our panelists. Um, um, it was um, um, a great um, uh, discussion and presentations were really um, helpful in terms of setting the um, setting the stage, um, um, defining the parameters of the issue, really, of the issues, really complex and, and broad, but also some solutions are possible, and it's really up to every single one of us to to make uh, our contribution and, and think creatively how we can address the issues in an integrated way. Um, now it's quarter to three. The session is planned to be until three. We have 15 minutes uh, for questions, not uh, so much time, but perhaps sufficient time for us to at least uh, try to address some of the um, um, questions that you may have. And of course, even after the session, uh, we all remain available for us to continue the dialogue. Uh, but also if you have any specific questions in terms of um, publications, analysis, or even one-to-one uh, -one, uh, questions or dialogues, um, all the panelists and us at uh, ANPRAC, we are of course available for, for us to, to keep the discussion going. So with that, I will first like to ask uh, if there are any questions from the room, please. Uh, and um, uh, um, my colleague uh, will be helping with the microphone. We'll, she will pass around the microphone if uh, there are any questions, and then we will move on to the online questions. Yes, please, we have a question here. Thank you. And if you can uh, introduce yourself and perhaps uh, tell us to, if you have specific uh, panelists that you are addressing the question to, or it's just a general question to any one of the panel. Thank you. Can you bring, bring closer the microphone? I think we've also covered that in the morning. So my question is, how accessible is that information to the broadest audience? 
information in uh, in Fiji specifically, right? Or yeah. Environmental impact assessment. Mm. Okay. Um, would any of the panelists would like to to address the question? Um, I hope you can hear it. I, I wasn't hearing well. Um, would any of the panel members uh, would like to take the question from the audience? Sonia, can you repeat it? Yes, yeah. So my question was in terms of access to information, the environmental sector assessment, how accessible is it to the top owners as well as non? And sorry, who's the environmental impact assessment? Some specific uh, environmental impact assessment uh, you're mentioning or? Generally. Mm -hmm. Which one? Mili, you can take it. Okay, Mili will take it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it was for Mili, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, Anika had spoken about the right to information and the work around that, but I will speak specifically for Fiji's case. Some of the environmental impact assessments reports to date have not been openly shared to the public and some of it not to resource owners as well. This is in light of the bauxite mining in Boa, because we were part of it with the Boa urban youths, you know, championing that these resource owners need to have a copy of the report, of the environment impact assessment report. And that was later given to them after so much knocking on the doors of the Ministry of Lands. Then finally, they started to open up and say, okay, this is, the, this is what the EIA report is about. But then again, in terms of the environmental impact assessment, this is just what I feel, but in terms of corruption and nepotism when it comes to the environmental impact assessment, some companies are finding it very easy to get a good environment impact assessment which makes us question to the independence of people in the Department of Environment who are conducting these impact assessments, unless they've been bribed or otherwise. But these are just some of the things that I'm saying. So, But in terms of how accessible the EIA has been, I think that is an issue for us right now in Fiji. And the Department of Environment, together with Malolo Friso, currently there's an ongoing trial right now and in terms of the environmental impact assessment. So how freely that has been given to us would be a good thing to ask the Department of Environment. If I might also be able to add to this. Yes, Can please, Tanika. Thank you. Um, I think just to, just to add that, uh, I mean, right to information is a powerful anti-corruption tool, but also a, a human rights tool that gives all persons the right to access information held by public bodies. So the principle is that all information held by governments and other public institutions is public information and other um, and should only be withheld from the public for legitimate reasons that are within the public interest. Now in the Pacific, we can say that the Cook Islands, Fiji, but it is not yet in force in Fiji, Palau and Vanuatu have formally adopted right to information laws. And it is anticipated that there may be another seven additional Pacific Island countries that may adopt such laws in the future. These include Micronesia, Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, Kiribati, um, and Tonga that has an information disclosure policy um, and Nauru that has proposed to appoint an ombudsman and Samoa that is considering such an adoption. But as you can see from that list, it is, um, I, we highlighted it as a concern. It is a key priority for us because currently we only formally have Cook Islands, Palau and Vanuatu that have right to information laws. Fiji has not yet put it into force. So um, you raise a really key point um, and one that we're trying to work with governments on, but also non-state actors. So the voice of civil society in pushing this is instrumental. 
So one of the reasons that Vanuatu got to have its legislation is that it was civil society that were such strong advocates of it. Um, so just to highlight that to you, thank you so much for the question. Yeah, and I'll actually add one more point about how can business and human rights help access to information and your larger question of getting access to documents, business and human rights and the whole concept of human rights due diligence. The whole idea is that consultation is meant to happen with affected communities and people as part of any process. So we work to expand that to say environmental issues and human rights issues need to be ones on which you're consulted on as part of a process. So it's not just about getting the information, it's about the fact that you are there as part of what's being done as well. So that's why I think it can be a useful supplement to, the, to uh, thinking about environmental issues. Thank you so much, uh, Milianika and Anita, uh, for really providing additional uh, clarification. And uh, uh, I think it just uh, speaks to the um, um, uh, need for really broadening our horizons uh, to consider what other issues are important for for promotion of uh, business uh, human rights and right to information is one. But as Anita also mentioned. The outcome is important as well as the processes. So we also want the processes to be based human rights um, based processes, which, mean we, which means we need meaningful participation by the stakeholders. We, we, we really want their voices to be integrated into the discussions and then reflected into the eventual policies, uh, for example, in um, the right to information uh, regimes that uh, will hopefully further roll out in the Pacific. Um, Yes, uh, please, uh, one more question from the audience. Thank you. Um, Shelley Lola here from Piango. Um, I just want to, to probably share a couple of, um, of uh, experiences that we had that, that might speak to, um, to the topic that we are talking about. Uh, it, it draw my attention to um, uh, the presentation that Vanuatu has uh, um, adopted the act for uh, free of information. Uh, interesting that we had also um, some funding from the UNDB to do um, uh, projects on public finance management. And so when COVID-19 hit, uh, we were trying to see how we can um, do something that is relevant to COVID, but still under the framework of the uh, Pacific um, of the of the public finance management. And the whole idea for the for the for the public finance management small grant that we are implementing is how we simplify the process of budget um, uh, process in country, so citizens will find uh, access to um, participate in the public finance um, um, possible. So there, 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 we work in Vanuatu and so the um, civil society umbrella NGO in Vanuatu um, wanted to use the fund that we had to track where the COVID-19 um, donor funds, uh, you know, ADB World Bank, they, they committed um, billions and millions of dollars that goes to uh, the country to respond to COVID um, from health to humanitarian um, with, with the TC Herald as well. So when they went out to, to do the exercise, um, the interesting thing that they find is that there is still limited understanding within the government ministry how the act should, should be rolled out. Because they still face with information being withheld. They still face with... Um, so my, my, my point, rather than going into details, my point is that, yes, one, one good step is, is to have an act. Uh, but I suppose for um, empowering the citizen to test it, yeah, which I think with the, with the experience that they had in Vanuatu, testing the process with the COVID-19 funding, trying to track. Um, we also do a bit of third-party 
uh, monitoring of the TC Herald in Fiji and in um, Vanuatu, uh, Gandavu and Lao. Same thing, yeah? you go in there, less than 60% of the relief funds that's supposed to go to community are still sitting around here somewhere in Fiji, in Suva. Yeah? It's alarming, but, but I think for us, what I'm, what I'm uh, interested when, when we are talking about corruptions is that all of us, we know it's happening, but why is it that, that no one is, what, 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 what is it, what, what, what is it that stop us from dealing with it? And one of the things that we recognize is that the cultural context of that, yeah? How do we remove ourselves from being a daughter, an auntie, or related to the person that is, even this morning we heard the AG talking about a business that they struggle because compliance is not there. But they couldn't do much because there are 300 workers working in this business, although they know that the, 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 the disaster that it caused to the environment is, is visible. Everybody in the community can see. But how do you deal with that kind of situation? Yeah. And I think this is where that we find that there is very little investment from the donor partners' money that goes to this kind of work to demand and build the capacity of our civil society and our community and our young people to voice out those things and not just voice out to go to the street and talk about it, but give them substantial um, testing points. Yeah? Give them funds like the poor community youth. Give them a, a fund where they could say, let's look at the scenario of procurement. Let's track where the money goes when Fiji here are doing all this whole construction work on the road. You know, if we are serious about this, pour in money into civil society and the citizens so that can they be empowered to test the system. It's just not enough to have a piece of legislation and sit there and then we tick the box and said, we are done. We are done in Vanuatu, we are done in Palau. And no, that's not enough. Yeah, give the testing tools for these people to test it out so that it makes sense. And for us to say, we change the way we think, because if we can't, we cannot, we cannot as soon as we up to, to, to put some people into um, judiciary system, to take them for, you know, hold them accountable, yeah? To pay for the, for the compliance that they, that they did not, uh, um, you know, the penalty, we pull back. Because this is the same people that you like live next door or you sit beside the church or you go to school with their daughter or, and we will be continued to face that kind of struggle because of how small we are and how communal we are and how we are related. But if we, if we give them that testing point so that we change the mindset that it's okay to hold people accountable and if they choose not to go um, in the right way, let them go to jail. But how do, we, how do we adapt ourselves into that kind of situation? I can be preaching about this forever, but I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for, for your intervention and for reminding us on um, the importance always to, to do reality check, to validate the assumptions, but also to ensure that uh, whatever policy is uh, uh, being adopted is based on the, on the needs and uh, the opinions of the people with, um, with a genuine uh, participatory approach. I would like, um, because we are running out of time, perhaps just to give a chance uh, to our online participants also to um, ask questions and uh, my colleagues uh, online. John, would you like to take um, a couple of questions from the online chat, please, uh, so that we, we give uh, also fair chance to, to the online. Although I'm aware we won't be able to cover all questions, but um, perhaps we can, we can just uh, stay a few more minutes to, to try and address a couple of more questions. Over to you, John, thank you. Uh, thanks, Sonia. I put a couple of the questions onto the share screen. Uh, so uh, first one was from Serena, at, uh, our good friend from TI in Australia. Uh, regarding the, the sanctions and remedies issue. I, I know Anita has uh, looked at this issue um, and perhaps either Anita, Annika or 
one of our others would like to make a quick response. And then a second one from Holly on the links between anti-corruption and procurement policies. So perhaps uh, Anita, if you respond first, then Annika, and then perhaps if Millie would like a final response. Great, thanks so much, John. And just a, really briefly to Serena's question, um, we are looking at this and we've only seen one successful case so far, Serena may know of others, but in, the, in Cambodia, in relation to land grabbing that's been done by the private sector um, through bribery and corruption, uh, a particular NGO, Equitable Cambodia, has been successful in challenging those land grabs in court and actually seeking restitution of land as a remedy option. So it's something that, again, we, we hope can be explored uh, further as we link these agendas. Uh, thank you very much. Um, maybe just one thing to um, add, Serena, one interesting looking at the legislative side, and I um, wish to acknowledge um, the comment made by um, Piengo that laws are not enough, they need to be implemented. And so it's only one step to a very long road. And sometimes the law and the policy is the easy bit in terms of everything, but it's the implementation that is key. One thing that we have seen in the Pacific is this conviction-based forfeiture. So you need to convict the person before you can look at the assets. And there is a little bit of a shift, but not enough of a shift happening in the Pacific for non-conviction-based forfeiture to be coming in. There are only very few countries that have it, but it is something that is in the UN Convention Against Corruption. Recommendations have come out about it, and we hope there'll be more action on this going forwards. Interestingly, in Palau, four assets that have... Um, I guess the way of putting it is that for the proceeds of crime um, that they are able to collect, there is a fund. And in that fund, there is a distribution that takes place where the law enforcement bodies that are involved in those investigations of prosecution are able to use those resources in order to pay for their um, ongoing costs, so to say, of that. But also there's a victim fund attached to it. And I think this is a key point and perhaps very interesting also to go to Anita's point and looking at victims going forwards. Um, in the Pacific, that is very unique. And Holly, um, your point on anti-corruption procurement, I agree. I think it would be great to have a panel specifically on this. It is a, a, a key area also through the human rights lens. Thank you. Millie, would you like to comment? And then I'll return to Sonia. Thank you so much. Um, uh, uh, there are no, uh, if there are no other burning questions from the online uh, panel, perhaps we can slowly uh, close the session. And I get a nodding from our OHCHR organizers, so I'll have to respect that. And. Um, let me just, uh, with a big thanks to, to the panelists, it was a fantastic uh, lineup of uh, speakers and also to all of you here. I will just um, uh, briefly uh, mention what are, um, uh, I think, uh, key takeaways from uh, this discussion. First, I think that the overarching message is very loud and clear. Corruption is a major human rights challenge and uh, in the business sector, corruption leads to systemic business related human rights abuses in various types of co commercial activities. And hence we need to, we need to work on, uh, on addressing them. COVID-19 was not particularly helpful. So uh, it has had a detrimental effect on human rights. Um, and uh, we also need to factor this uh, consideration in our uh, steps uh, looking forward in addressing corruption and business related um, um, uh, human rights issues. Um, we learned also about the international regional uh, commitments framework. We have the ANCAC, we have agenda 2030. Please always remember to that these are important um, for us to have the long-term uh, a vision in front of us and also while uh, we are working on a step-by-step -step daily activities and having our short-term, mid-term and uh, uh, longer-term uh, plans to achieve uh, progress. The different sectors, the government, uh, business uh, actors, civil society, youth in particular are very important. They have specific roles to play individually and collectively to address business related uh, human rights uh, uh, abuses in the Pacific, but also as well uh, globally and in an integrated uh, way. 
So with these uh, considerations in mind, I, uh, uh, the session, uh, I think, just um, renewed our commitment uh, for continued exploration of these linkages between corruption, business, and human rights, and for even more resolved uh, uh, actions for addressing uh, the related uh, challenges. On that note, let me once again thank uh, our colleagues from OHCSR for organizing the event, all participants for the lively discussions and the questions, and the panelists for shedding light to the very important nexus between corruption, human rights, and businesses. I thank you once again. I hope to stay, that we will stay in touch and we are open for continued dialogue. I wish you a good day and um, a successful uh, event um, uh, uh, with the other sessions uh, to, that are to be organized during this uh, very important uh, forum. Thank you very much and I wish you all the best.